Hello everyone, this is the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast, and I'm your host, Steph Bodrini. This podcast is for everyone who wants to be part of our real estate family and learn commercial real estate investing from A to Z. I'll be sharing with you tips and tricks for real estate investing while being mentored by a few people with several years of experience. And my goal is to keep things very straightforward because I value your time and you're here to learn. With that, in the last episode, we reviewed the Investor Summit at Sea and also shared a few lessons we learned while at the summit. And in this episode, I will be interviewing Ruben Tornberg. He is a commercial real estate broker with CBRE in San Francisco and specializes in helping startups, technology companies, and venture capital firms find and manage office space in the San Francisco Bay Area and beyond. He is also an avid basketball player and loves to travel and explore with friends. Ruben, thank you so much for being with us. Of course, thank you for having me on. How are you? Awesome. I'm so excited to be here. We are actually in the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, which is the tallest building in SF, and I believe will be for the next 50 years. Should be. (laughs) Second tallest on the West Coast. Amazing. It's gorgeous. If you guys come to San Francisco one day, make sure to check it out. Always welcome. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about your background? Sure, sure. So I'm from New Jersey, born right outside New York City. I went to school in Florida at the University of Miami, uh, Colombian background. Right after school, I came back to New Jersey and I immediately started working for CBRE, where I currently work now, the largest real estate firm in the world. I was there for about three years. Then I left to join a company called Custom Spaces. It was a very small boutique real estate firm here, led by a woman named Jenny Haig, who's a powerhouse broker here in San Francisco. I was there for about a little over a year, and then we were reacquired by CBRE, the same company. Oh, wow. And so it was a nice move across country, um, a little bit of a title bump, and Um, I've been very happy here ever since. Given your experience working with startups, leasing office space for them, obviously not only Silicon Valley is a good market, but now there are so many markets popping up Mm -hmm. for real estate leasing for startups. What do startups look for when leasing an office? Sure. Every startup is in rapid growth mode, right? At the very beginning, you don't know exactly what your projections are 12 months out, even six months out. So you're looking for space to do a few things. The main one is to attract talent. The second is to manage your growth. You know, you don't wanna get an office that's too big and be hemorrhaging money. The third thing is staying flexible. It's very hard, both in San Francisco and throughout the world, to find space that will let you stay flexible as you continue to grow. Landlords are generally looking for three to five year terms. So you have to be creative in how you're able to position your client to to stay short term. So a huge thing is actually getting into subleasing. So Mm. a lot of companies that are growing too quickly or shrinking faster than they'd hope need to offload space for, you know, 12 months, 18 months, which tend to be very, very attractive situations for our clients. So who would be responsible for leasing that space, the tenant or the landlord? It's actually the tenant is responsible. They become a sub-landlord in that instance, and they put the space in the sublease market, usually at a premium here in San Francisco because it is so attractive to startups. And then once they manage that whole leasing process, they need to get what's called landlord consent, where they present the sublease to the landlord, and the landlord has 30 days to say, yes, we would like this new tenant, or no, So another huge thing for startups here is being near public transit. Attracting talent in San Francisco has become extremely difficult. They've now looked off to the East Bay, definitely a lot of talent down in the South Bay with Stanford, with Berkeley in the East Bay. Being near Caltrain and being near BART is a huge, huge plus. And rents are much higher near those areas. So startups try and find a big in-between. Subleasing is one option. Another big one, at least while you're small, let's say under 20 employees, is finding these live works 
a lot of live works have popped up in San Francisco near Caltrain where you aren't required to live in them. They're a little bit cheaper than traditional office space here, which is getting more and more expensive every year. Since 2010, it's more than doubled. And they will offer you a flexible term. They'll only do a one-year deal. So it's mm. the ideal situation for a growing startup that's between five and 15 people, doesn't know where they're gonna be in a year, but wants something that can help them maintain flexibility. And then the final one, which is becoming more and more popular and is now the biggest discussion point in San Francisco and maybe in the country, is the concept of co-working space. The WeWorks of the world, the Notels, Industrious, Regis, they are presenting solutions that are very, very attractive to startups. You pay on a monthly basis, you don't need to buy any furniture, you don't need to pay for internet, it is all just managed for you. Why don't we go over the pricing to SF, which will probably translating <laughs> to the same step pricing process in other locations. Totally. So this is a moving target. Obviously, it changes pretty much every quarter in markets like this in San Francisco. But right now, the average asking rate for space is $83 per square foot per year. You know, this is up over 100% from 2011 when I think we were at the high 30s, maybe $37 a square foot. So you can see if you were to put it on a chart, it would just go straight up. And you know maybe we're due for a downturn and I expect in that downturn, it will go straight back down. Kind of like how it did after the dot-com boom. Now, as you get a little more granular, when you enter these co-working spaces, they tend to be more expensive on a per square foot basis because they cover everything. Picture anything from $105 a square foot up to $140 a square foot. So about one and a half times? About one and a half times. At, at the maximum? Sure. But when you take into account buying your own furniture, sure. if you need to do any space yeah. build out, paying for internet, maintaining the space, it can get a little bit closer. The cheaper ones, the live works, those tend to be more closer to $60 a square foot or $65 a square foot. And those options are really attractive for companies that have just gotten their seed funding and don't want to spend a ton of money on office space. Office space is, uh, they call it a sunk cost, kind of like when you're renting in an apartment, you're paying this monthly rate, you're not getting anything back, there's mm -hmm. no appreciation. So we advise our clients to really pay as little as you can until you get big and, and need to pay for office space to attract the legitimate talent and stay as flexible as you can. Don't get yourself stuck in a five-year lease where you're gonna grow out of it in a year and be forced to to either sublease or, or take a hit. Mm -hmm. And then what are the prices if the office is near public transportation versus not? Sure, so as you get closer to public transportation, they go up from, let's say, 78 up to $95 a square foot. Okay. And this is right now, it can be totally different in two or three months. It, it really fluctuates more on the upside than the downside. And <laughs> as you stray further and further away, it can get all the way down to $55, $60 a square foot. Now, there's a few other variables to take into consideration, right? The condition of the space. Is it in shell condition and needs a ton of work? Did the landlord do what's called a spec build and build it out completely in advance for a new tenant to say, wow, this is beautiful, I'll take it. Does it have a dropped ceiling, which is very unattractive to startups and tech companies, and those are priced much cheaper. Hmm. So if you're in financial services in San Francisco, you're probably getting a deal. Hmm. Um, the spaces that tend to be the most expensive are the ones that all the tech firms want. Is it creative? Does it have high ceilings, brick walls, <laughs> polished concrete floors, tons of meeting rooms? and things like that. So besides all of these pointers that startups are looking for, which is basically an old warehouse, what are some other specific things that they look for when leasing an office? Sure, so those tie into the really biggest main question, right? Will this place help us attract talent? Once you get past that, it goes into a lot of the comfort stuff. So a big one is how many meeting rooms are in the space? A lot, a lot of times, startups like to be in a wide open environment to A, maximize the amount of people you can fit, and B, to endorse collaboration, to have everyone talking, hanging out, help the culture. But everyone at some point needs to enclose themselves in a room to have a private conversation. The question is, are there enough meeting rooms for us to fit? This is frequently a pain point. We have a metric actually for it and it, it will vary between companies, but we say that startups should have at least one meeting room for every seven to 10 employees. 
So okay. let's say you have 50 employees, you would, should get at least five meeting rooms. Okay. Another one is size. Can we fit our employees for the duration of the term? If this is a three-year lease, but we're going to be blowing out of it in a year, do we need to take on more space? These two have become really big recently, but the first is, are there enough restrooms? Because these tech companies are trying to jam as many people as they can into spaces in old buildings that weren't necessarily built for that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have one of these industrial buildings that's zoned for office with only one restroom, but you have 40 people that you fit in the space in about 5,000 square feet, let's say, and there's lines for the bathroom, or you need to go to a nearby cafe to use the bathroom, or it's just one unisex bathroom, not boys and girls split. So these are, you know, kind of smaller pain points that tend to be really important once you've experienced it. On that same tack, most buildings in San Francisco do not have HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, because San Francisco is a very temperate city that generally isn't much of a need for it. But, you know, now you can get into the whole global warming conversation, <laughs> but especially, you know, for a few weeks during the summer, it gets pretty hot. And if your windows don't open and you don't have any HVAC, it becomes very, very difficult to work. So these kind of living conditions of the space are, are also very important. This was part one of our two-part interview with Ruben. You can find his full contact information below under notes on this podcast, as well as on the blog post. In the next episode, we will be talking about what happens if a startup goes out of business. We'll talk about LOIs and lease negotiation and what makes for a good office landlord. If you have any friends that would be interested in learning what we are teaching in this podcast, make sure to share it with them. See you guys next time.